Thank you, Jen. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you might be in, um, or perhaps Canadian uh, nurse educators have joined us as well. So as you see, there's a little bit about me on this slide. Um, and you know, I'm called Iggy. Um, and I just bring that to your attention because I didn't name myself that. The faculty and students did that because no one could really say Ignatabuchus as well as Jen could. Uh, so I appreciate her pronunciation. Um, as you know, you probably know that I do a lot of writing, but in addition, um, I've been teaching for a long time in both pre and post licensure programs, uh, primarily RN to BSN in the post licensure. Um, I am known as a leading academic nursing education consultant in curriculum development and instruction and evaluation. Um, so I do a lot of work in that area, a lot of speaking, and in particular for this conference, I've been working with schools, helping them plan and develop and implement and evaluate their concept-based curricula for just about 15 years now. Uh, so I have a lot of experience to share with you. I finally got around to taking that certified nurse educator uh, exam. Um, and in 2007, uh, I was inducted uh, to the very prestigious, and I'm very proud of this, the NLN Academy of Nursing Education. So I was inducted as a fellow. That's what that A-N-E-F at the end of my name means. So let's talk a little bit about concept-based curriculum and compare it to really the term conceptual learning. I'm gonna be using the term generalist and advanced practice uh, throughout my presentation. And I know that you realize that generalist education is pre-licensure in RN to BSN and advanced practice, of course, a graduate program, graduates of those master's and doctoral programs that are APRN. So I say that only to say that in my experience, there are more generalist programs who do concept-based curriculum than graduate programs. That doesn't mean that if you teach in a graduate program that you would not want to consider this as an approach for your curriculum, particularly if you're in a track um, that is not a nurse practitioner track. So if you're teaching in administration or education, that certainly would be appropriate for you. These terms, concept-based curriculum, which I'm going to sometimes call CBC, and conceptual learning are not the same, but they are very related. A concept-based curriculum is the structure. It's the structure of your curriculum. So the key word in that definition is structure, and it's a formal structure. Um, as you know, the structure is designed by organizing specific content around the program concepts that you select that are appropriate for your faculty, for your students, and for your program. Most schools can do this part on their own. I find that many times uh, they can pull this together, they can come up with concepts. Not necessarily that it's easy, but they oftentimes do this by themselves. However, conceptual learning is a very different animal in that it's a process of active student learning. So it's really the operationalization of this formal concept-based curriculum. It absolutely requires active student engagement. Uh, doing all lectures in a concept-based curriculum is not conceptual learning. So I really want to point that out. We used to call this instruction but instruction doesn't really work in a CBC because that implies what the faculty are doing. It's a faculty-centered, teacher-centered focus on teaching. What we really need to do instead is focus on the students and their learning needs. So it's student-centered. And I think that makes a big differentiation between, between excuse me, the traditional curriculum and conceptual learning with a CBC. I also should mention that both these terms involve all learning environments. That is your didactic environment in the class or online or both, your clinical environment, whether it's simulation, lab, or community. And I bear that uh, note to you because I want you to know that there are programs who come to me and say, we just want to do concept-based in class. We don't want anything to do with clinical. We don't want to change clinical at all. And if that is what you want to do, I'm going to tell you that it probably won't be as successful as you would hope because students will have a real problem with connection. And as you know, Dr. Benner has said for years, including in her 
very famous work of 2010 with the Carnegie Foundation that students do not see a relationship already between class and didactic and clinical. So if we develop a new curriculum model that's concept-based, and again, we don't look at all learning environments, it's likely not to be as successful and students, again, will not see that relationship. So let's talk now about your pre-planning for curricular transition. So on this next slide, you'll see one of three points that I'm going to make that really are built on the work of Erickson and Lanning. And I do have that reference in your slides at the end. So Lynn Erickson is credited really with the entire CBC movement in the country. Uh, and in fact, uh, she in 2002 wrote her first book on concept-based learning, conceptual learning and thinking. And what she did, she said that there's too much knowledge. You know, the knowledge explosion is just tremendous and it continues to be exponentially exploding. Um, and as she was teaching in K through 12, and this is where CBC comes from, K through 12 education, I'm sure your kids and your grandkids I know my grandson is talking about conceptualization in the second grade, but they have to do that because it's just too much knowledge. And instead, we need them to learn the important concepts and then how to be successful in being resourceful to find additional information. So in her work, she has really laid out the tenets of CBC and now health professions education, including nursing, and including other fields that aren't health professions are jumping on the CBC train because it's not a fad, it is here to stay because the knowledge is not going to get any less than it is today. So my first point on this slide, which again comes from Erickson and Lanning, when pre-planning for a curricular transition, they say that the first thing we need to do is examine the hidden impediments. Now, I put in parens sort of what I think that means for nursing and what I have seen in practice, and that is that we have to have buy-in. That is absolutely the number one question I'm asked. Everywhere I go, how do I get faculty to buy-in? And as you know about change theory, we don't need all people involved, all stakeholders on board. But the change theorists say we need at least 40%. So if you're trying to decide, is it ready? You know, are we ready? Can we do it? I would say to you, if you have 40 or 50%, you should roll with it because this is the way to go. Now, some reasons why, or some impediments, reason why there may not be faculty buy-in, and I just listed a few, you may come up with a longer list, is that there is some resistance to change for some people, not everybody. And again, this is not my interpretation, this is really what Erickson says, that she found that teachers uh, in K through 12 were resistant to change. They were used to doing it one way, they knew the outcomes, they were comfortable, and it is work to make this sort of change. Another point is that there's a belief that doing curriculum revision is really not part of a teacher's role, of a faculty's role. And you see, I've started that because I'm going to convince you that it is part of faculty role. And I do hear people say, well, I need extra load for that. And if you can grant that, that's awesome. But it is part of a nurse academic nurse educator as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Be sure, however, that you do have curriculum revision in your role description for faculty so that um, they are accountable for that. Also, hey, our current curriculum is working fine. We have positive program outcomes. If it's a generalist program, a pre-licensure, do we have great NCLEX results? Yeah, we've got good program uh, completion. Our graduates are liked by our community. They're being hired, they're getting jobs. So why do I need to change? Um, if you're in a graduate program, the certification outcomes, the program completion, uh, why would we want to change? We want to change because it's a dynamic process, and we'll talk more about that. And then I think the scariest part of the whole thing is just lack of knowledge. Even if you have a master's in nursing education or a doctorate in education or nursing education, you probably didn't learn a lot about conceptual uh, learning or CBC. In fact, when I talk to graduate faculty, even in the nurse education track, and I ask them how much time they spend on helping their students learn about concept-based curriculum, I've heard everything from 30 minutes to two hours. Yet, well over 50% of nursing programs in this country already have a CBC. So 
it seems to me that we need to spend more time. So if you're teaching in a graduate program and an education track, I would just urge you to uh, rethink how much time you're spending in your curriculum courses um, on the CBC, because that's where many of your graduates are going to be working. They're going to be going to a program, usually a pre-licensure program, um, that will be doing a CBC and focusing on conceptual learning. So a little bit more about that STARD uh, uh, specific uh, point that I made, that revision is not part of the faculty role. On the next slide, you'll see that the National League for Nursing uh, tells us that it is within the scope of our practice for academic nurse educators to be working with curriculum. And in fact, there's a number of statements in the scope of practice for academic nurse educators. And remember, if you're a nursing education, if you're a nursing educator, uh, or you're in nursing education full time, that is your role. So we have to learn the best practices and what the responsibilities are. So this is just an example of one of many statements about the requirement for academic nurse educators, faculty um, in their competencies and the eight competencies that they have to be involved in revising curriculum. And based on assessment of their outcomes, learner needs, and I love this part, societal and healthcare trends. So society right now is pushing concept-based. It's how do we manage all the knowledge we have and where do we go, where are the resources we go to when we need additional information. Um, I should also mention to you that, as you know, there's a certified nurse educator exam now, and that's one of the things you have to know to pass the certification. Uh, to get your CNE is to know about the scope of practice for academic nurse educators. Um, in addition, um, we now know that because we have that CNE exam, uh, nurse educators, academic nurse educators are considered to be in an advanced practice role. Another point on the next slide about uh, this whole issue that it's not part of my job. Um, and again, you may not be in a program that says who says that, where people say that, but believe me, I've heard it a lot. Uh, Billings and Halstead, I know you know those very famous uh, nurse educators and nurse education researchers uh, in their fifth edition in 2016 say that curriculum revision is inevitable. Things are changing so quickly. It's a very dynamic world we live in. Healthcare is changing. And I've been to programs where they say we haven't touched our curriculum in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. To me, it's very hard to fathom that that can be the case. They also say very specifically that the faculty drive the curriculum. The faculty is responsible for developing curriculum. And I say that because I have been in other programs where um, nurse, a nurse administration, uh, administration rather, uh, begins to try to uh, take over the curriculum. And it's not the nurse administrator who makes those decisions, it's the faculty. And certainly there are many changes, Billings and Halstead go on to say, that there's many changes in society, as I mentioned before, but also educational research drives the need for the process of curriculum revision. We are getting a lot of educational research in a variety of teaching learning modalities, assessment modalities, curricular modalities. Uh, we're just beginning to see some research on the effectiveness of CBC. Uh, so we're moving in that direction. So we, just like in healthcare, best practices drive practice best practices from research and education drive what we do in curriculum. So on the next slide, the second point that Erickson and Lanning makes, and again, we're talking about what you need to consider when you're pre-planning for a curricular transition, is that we want to shape or develop a shared vision of concept-based curriculum. And that means that we not only want to do the structure part, but we want to think about the process part. How is it going to be delivered? What's the instruction going to look like? And that helps us build teams. I think there's a lot of learning by doing uh, when you go through a process like this. But there is a requirement for education through a variety of conferences. There are at least two conferences that I'm aware of that are completely devoted uh, each year completely devoted to uh, CBC. One of them is mine uh, in April, um, but there, there are several and, there's, and also there's usually some breakout sessions or keynotes on CBC at some of the other nurse educator conferences. A consultation, um, that's what I do a lot of. Uh, really, it should be a facilitator role though. It shouldn't be, at least it is my philosophy, not all consultants may agree with this, 
But my philosophy is you drive the curriculum, you develop the curriculum, I'm just the person that keeps you on the right track. I'm the facilitator, I can tell you what's happening nationally, this is what I'm seeing, no, I don't really see that, but you certainly can do that. It's not, I'm not the veto person, I'm just the person to try to get you to where you want to be. So consultation is really important in this process, particularly if you don't have a lot of in-house consultants in this area. And then, of course, the literature. We have a lot of articles now on how to put together CBC, how to evaluate the CBC, and so forth. So the third point that Erickson and Landing makes is that we need somebody to do the work, and that's on this next slide. If you have a large curriculum, you don't want everybody writing every word because you won't get past the philosophy. And you're probably chuckling when I say that, you've probably been there. If you have a very large faculty and you say, well, Donna, what is very large? I would say if you have more than 10 faculty, even more than eight faculty, I would select a subgroup or have them volunteer. And they can be a task force. They don't have to be a committee. You know, committees never end, but a task force, when the work is done, you disband. Uh, to develop a task force who can really do the hard work of the process with the assistance and input of faculty. That's gonna be so important that not only does this curriculum task force get the information from faculty and literature and whomever else you go for, but also make sure that at every step, faculty are involved, they know the direction you're moving in, they get buy-in, um, and they really need to approve it. I always recommend that there are various points, and we usually plan those in the timeline, but at various points, we need to present with the work they've done, the task force has done, and then get it approved by faculty, get their input, post it on your internet or whatever your, your uh, communication system is, and then let them respond, ask questions. It's so important. We don't want this group to look secretive and, and uh, look like they're not really sharing with the rest of the group. So important to get that. Again, you don't need 100%, but you need enough to keep moving. That will allow you to do this last point on the slide, and that's adhere to the planned timeline, and you do need a timeline. And I always, when I help faculty do timelines, I start at the end, and I say, when do you want this curriculum to start, this new curriculum? And then we back it up. So it should take, it should not take five years. I have been with programs, I have come to programs, they say, we've been working on this for four years, and we're not even at the first course yet. Well. There's something wrong with that, because by the time you develop the curriculum, it's going to be out of date. So my uh, observation has been throughout the country that it takes about a year and a half to two and a half years from idea. And I don't mean idea like, hey, maybe we should do this. I'm talking about an idea commitment. So I wouldn't, wouldn't really say idea by itself, but idea commitment. We are committed to doing this. We have an idea that we want to do this, and we're committed to doing it. So from that point, to implementation. That is why you see the, the uh, variability in years because it's gonna depend on your system. So let's talk a little bit now that we've gone through the three points for pre-planning. Let's talk about some tips for development and implementation. Um, and we'll first talk about approach because I think the hard part about approach is no two programs have exactly the same concept-based curriculum. And that makes it very difficult in doing large-scale research. Um, but that's okay because Dr. Giddens, as you know, she's sort of the founder of mother, uh, excuse me, the mother of modern day curriculum. Uh, in her book, Concepts of Nursing Practice, the second edition, um, you're probably very familiar with it, she has provided for us sort of a, a menu of where we want to go just to get us started. Um, they're not necessarily all research-based, um, although there's research cited in the book. Um, they're not always necessarily um, maybe the best terms that you think your students would understand. So you're not committed to use the pure package, the entire Giddens package. In fact, some places I've been, I think there's about 57 or 58 concepts in that, in that particular resource. Um, some schools I've been to have 65, 87. I was in Canada and I had 80 some in one of the programs there, um, concepts. 
Um, but I don't find that very typical. What I find more typical is a modified curricular approach. Um, I've heard uh, another consultant call this hybrid, but I don't want to confuse you between the online hybrid versus what I'm talking about here. So I sort of prefer the modified because it doesn't get us mixed up with the online terminology. The modified simply means that you're going to use what you think works for your students because the students, being student-centered, come front and center. They're the first priority for putting this together. So will they be able to understand words like cellular regulation? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe you might want to use metabolism as opposed to something else. So you can use your own words. You don't have to have the exact same words. Um, you might want to use oxygenation instead of um, gas exchange. So again, that's purely up to you. But whatever you use, you have to be sure that you define the concept so that every faculty member in that program understands that when you say X concept, we all know what that means. The other thing I would tell you as an approach is that there are a lot of companies, including uh, commercial testing companies, uh, publishers, and others, who are selling entire packages. And I, I'm not faulting their packages. What I'm just asking you to do is don't just take their package and let that guide your curriculum. You should be the folks who plan the curriculum, direct the curriculum, drive the curriculum, and then go to these companies, have them do their presentations or whatever, you, whatever way you want to go about it, and then select the best learning resources that support or align with your curriculum. But those packages should not be the curriculum. And that's the point I'm trying to make. So I hope nobody goes back to their publisher and says, Donna said we shouldn't use your company. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying don't just blindly, because it's easy. It would be easy just to say, okay, company X, I'll just use you and that'll be our curriculum. Because then you're stuck with how they package it, their definition, the way they play it out, their resources, and you don't really want that to happen. You are the expert educators. You need to make that decision. So you want to develop a curriculum that meets the needs of your locale. You know, perhaps you're in the Southwest or you're in the Northeast. There are differences in um, health trends in those areas. Uh, your organizational culture. Um, perhaps you have a culture that, uh, that makes it difficult to make decisions as a whole group. Uh, maybe you do better with a whole group. So you have to look at how your culture is put together. And will you fit and continue to fit with your institution? Faculty, will faculty be able to understand and utilize this curriculum? And will students understand it? Again, it's all about being student-centered. And that's a question I always ask when I'm working with a program. Will students understand that word? Will students understand how you put those exemplars together with those concepts? It's all about the students. A couple more tips on this uh, next slide about the approach. Um, some people like to begin with concepts, and that's not the right place to begin. I've actually had calls from programs that have said, well, we have our concepts, and I say, okay, uh, we're stuck on the exemplars, okay, uh, and where to put them. So then I start asking questions. Well, how did you change your degree plan, your plan of study? Uh, did you relook at your program learning outcomes? Uh, did you? No, we didn't do any of that. We just went right to concepts. We're going to keep our courses the way they are and throw some concepts in. And you'll see some programs, and I have been to some programs, where they took their current curriculum. They may or may not have desaturated, you know, desaturation, right? Cut out some of the fluff. And then they just plopped a concept in front of the disease process or the professional issue um, and said, yep, we're concept-based. Some people have told me they're already concept-based, but I don't see it. So you really want to start by revisiting. doesn't mean you have to change it, but revisit your mission if you have one, philosophy if you have one. Some people have just a mission and not a philosophy. Some people have just a philosophy and not a mission. And some people have both. doesn't matter. As long as you are clear somewhere in that mission and philosophy what you believe about nursing. What is it you believe about what who nurses are? Do nurses are nurses patient centered? 
our nurses leaders, whatever that terminology is. You need to explain that in a paragraph or so. It doesn't have to be long. You also want your philosophy of learning. If you believe that adults are learners who can be self-directed, self-motivated, that they're into discovery and spirit of inquiry, you need to say that. The funny thing I've noticed is that a lot of philosophies do actually say that, but then when I stand in, or I sit in the back of a room and I watch the faculty stand up and lecture for an hour, I don't see that adult learners are being engaged. I don't see that they're using a spirit of inquiry. I don't see that they're being resourceful and looking up information or thinking or engaging with each other in active learning. So we want to be sure that what we say in our philosophy really does happen. If you believe in conceptual learning, we should say that on our philosophy. The other thing you want to look at in this first point is the program learning outcomes. You want to be sure that the learning outcomes, and those learning outcomes are what do you want your new graduate to look like when walking out the door, right? When they, at the end of the, at the end of the rainbow, at the end of your plan of study, degree plan, they're completed, they're ready to graduate. What do you want them to know? What are the competencies in broad terms, the five or six main areas that you want them to focus on? And you'll notice I mentioned the word competency. There are some myths traveling about that one has to choose between competency-based program and a concept-based program. I don't see it's an either or. I like to have both because I want my students to develop or get to the point of meeting competencies about those concepts. So it's very integrated. The second point on this slide is that we want to look at our plan of study. And most, not all, but most concept-based curricula do use a lifespan approach. It helps get away from the medical model and it also helps prevent duplication. I was at a program recently where I asked them, where do they teach diabetes? And I believe it was a two-year program and the uh, associate degree. Uh, and the uh, faculty said, well, in our course, we uh, fundamentals, this is our first semester, we touch on it. We teach them about glucose monitoring and giving insulin. And then the next semester, we touch on it too. We talk about X, Y, and Z. And the third semester says, we touch on it. Well, it turns out that the student is getting a very fragmented education, particularly if they're learning diabetes by specialty. What does it look like in critical care? What does it look like with PEDS? What does it look like with OB? So diabetes is diabetes. But then we just have to make adjustments in our care when we look at that population within the context of that care. So I just want to say, if you can go to a lifespan approach, I would do so because then you can teach diabetes, at least chronic, basic, stable diabetes, one time across the lifespan and students get it. They can then connect the concept of metabolism or glucose regulation, whatever you decide to call it, you, they can connect that across population. And I think that's crucial. And my last slide for approach on the next slide, it's just a few more points. And that is that for generalist programs particularly, and, and I would say this is also true for advanced practice, but I don't get as involved in advanced practice, at least with a clinical nurse uh, practice, uh, family practice. Um, I do more with free licensure in our end of ESN. However, um, I would tell you that we have too much content. Books, the, the med search books, yes, I know, I write one. Uh, P's books, everything is so big. And there are many of us who are trying to cut it down. But as soon as we cut it down significantly, uh, faculty say, oh, you're not comprehensive. Well, the day and age of being comprehensive is over. It is over. We have to decrease content and emphasize the most important pieces of information they have to know. And one way to desaturate is not just to desaturate in the med surge area, but also really look at your specialty area. Um, how many times are we teaching therapeutic communication? How many times are we talking about hypertension? How many times are we talking about ethics? So we need to really think about, are we spending too much time in trying to create little critical care nurses and little OB nurses? I know I'm using the old term OB, I know, maternal nurses. Um, what are we trying to do? Probably the one area that should not be decreased 
and I'm sure you'll agree with me, is mental health. Because mental health is the only area, those of you teaching mental health probably just want to hooray, right? Um, mental health is the only area that crosses all specialties, all populations, all settings, uh, and all ages. So we have to really look at what we're teaching in mental health. But are we teaching in patients mental health? I've had that happen before too. I've gone to places where they say we take our students, I went to a baccalaureate program recently, they said we only take our students to inpatient, which is a very small percent of population in mental health, on a locked unit. That is not helping the students see the general population of mental health disorders, people on the street, people in their class who are who have a mental health diagnosis or have issues with mental health and are perhaps medicated or using some other modality. I think for all programs, and I would say generalist and advanced practice, we need to really focus on the profession of nursing and the professional nursing concepts and healthcare concepts, including clinical judgment. There's a lot in the literature right now, and I've heard a lot of speakers talk about clinical judgment, clinical reasoning, critical thinking, all of these terms, and they're not really the same. Uh, clinical judgment is the end result of that decision you make when you reason. You use scientific and clinical reasoning based on the evidence. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing has just adopted a definition of clinical judgment for the NCLEX um, as they are doing their research on better ways to test clinical judgment on the NCLEX examination. And I suspect in two to three years, we're going to begin to see some, it might be sooner, uh, we're going to begin to see some different formats on the NCLEX because selecting all that apply or selecting one choice out of four is really not what happens in the real world of practice. Nobody gives you four choices about how to care for a patient who's deteriorating. So we know that we have to do something different. Quality improvement is getting a lot of attention with uh, through CUSIN. If you follow the CUSIN Institute uh, now being um, now housed um, in uh, Cleveland, uh, we know that we want to be sure, in case we want to be sure that um, we are following CUSIN because CUSIN is the only research, and that's probably the thing that I think holds all programs together is the focus on the CUSIN concepts and competencies. Um, and I might add that they're going to not only say, not only saying that quality improvement should be more emphasized, but also we might add a seventh competency, and that would be systems thinking. Dr. Moore, Dr. Shirley Moore, Dr. Mary Delansky, and others have uh, done quite a, a bit of work and have even developed a tool on how to measure systems thinking. Uh, systems thinking is not just a DNP uh, concept, it's not just uh, allowed in doctoral programs, but in fact, uh, an example uh, might be that we want our students, they learn how to care for individuals, they learn how to prevent pressure injury, for example, um, or how to promote nutrition, but they look at their one patient or client or their, or their assignment. Looking at systems thinking, if they approach it from a systems thinking standpoint, they're looking at the entire unit. What is our pressure injury rate? Um, what can we do collectively? What's the best practice? What are the best practices? What does the evidence say about how we can understand and value that our complex health system does prevent us from doing some of the things we want to do, but what can we do that influences positively the care of each patient on our unit? So that's really the systems thinking approach. And it's going to be, I believe, the next big uh, competency that's going to be talked about with Keith and it perhaps might be added to the Keith and Institute because there is a move to do that. So you're going to hear a lot in the future about systems thinking. So if you're doing a CBC or not doing a CBC, you still want to focus on clinical judgment, quality improvement, systems thinking, and all the professional nursing concepts that are so crucial. I might also mention that you don't see the word nursing process there. Um, and the nursing process, albeit not dead, um, because it still is in every nurse practice act, is defined on the NCLEX even as a scientific reasoning approach. So they're moving away from that five linear step, and I know you're going to say it's not linear and cyclical. I get that. But nursing process is not really the way that confident, 
seasoned nurses practice. It's how we start and then we move to clinical judgment. And Dr. Tanner and others have done a lot of work in this area. That's Christine Tanner. You want to Google her uh, on models of clinical judgment that really serve our practice nurses very well, and we need to introduce that to our students. So let's say a few more words about timeline. So how do I create a timeline that's realistic? I already had mentioned the, the one and a half to two and a half years. Really, I think you have to think about being realistic based on your college or university or school um, mechanisms for approval. If you were in a very large university, for example, you not only have to get program approval and perhaps department approval, and then College of Health Science approval, and then university approval, and then on and on. So it can take a lot longer, perhaps even Senate approval. So whatever that process is, that's gonna be lengthy. Um, I'm working with a program now, but that's exactly, we wanna implement in fall, or I'm sorry, I think it might be spring, um, of 19. Um, or it might be fall of 19, I'm sorry. Um, but it's gonna take all this time from now until then, and the program is pretty much roughed out. So it's gonna take all that time for approval because you have all those layers to go through. Now, if you're a small school, you're a single entity, university or college or school, or you are a career school, whatever you might be, you might have a much more simple uh, process. So you have to build in time. That's why I like to start at the end and work backwards. We know also that your state may require, whether it's a board of nursing because you're a pre-licensure program, or in some states, they also oversee R and BSN program. Um, whether it's that particular entity, that agency, the board of nursing, or maybe it's the uh, board of higher education or commission or regents, whatever your system is, you have to build all that in. And then there's national processes also. Because if you're accredited, you'll have the accreditation piece as well, the nursing accreditation piece as well. Perhaps you might even need to go through your university or college accreditation as well. So there's many, many layers. And that's why I think for some schools it takes two to two and a half years just because it takes them a year, year and a half to even get through all the processes. So be sure that you're realistic when you are planning. Um, I know sometimes, particularly the programs I've worked with that might be in trouble with their boards of nursing, you know, the boards of nursing want them to fix everything by the next semester. That's really not possible. If you're just going to band-aid your curriculum, perhaps that's good enough to get you through board of nursing, but really that's not what we want to do. We don't want to band-aid it. We don't want to switch and swap topics around. That's really not a good curriculum design. In addition to that, with timeline on the next slide, you have to remember that it's going to depend also on faculty productivity, their time, and their buy-in. I have been in programs where the productivity has been amazing. It has been so amazing. And then others where they just take a very, very long time because they say they don't have the time. So time is important. So now that I've talked about the tips for development implementation. Just a couple of more slides about successes, and then we'll get to some questions. So a couple of things just to share with you from my experience. It's not good enough to just do the structure. You need professional development that's customized to help your faculty learn how to teach conceptually. Honestly, you don't just wake up, as you know, tomorrow and say, okay, now I'm going to start teaching conceptually because that's not how it happens. It does take a while to learn how to do that. So be sure that you build in professional development if you're going to do this process. Next, be sure your students are informed. Be sure your students are informed, both your current students and your pre-nursing students if you are in a pre-nursing program or in a pre-licensure program. Um, it's gonna be so important that they know how this will affect them and also solicit the current students' input because who knows best about what your new curriculum should look like? It's your students. Be sure that when you're figuring out your teach-out plan that you account for those students who fail courses in your old curriculum or your current curriculum, but if that course that they fail is never going to be given again, what will you do? Will you 
have them do voiceover PowerPoint from the old curriculum and keep it that way? Have you notified them a year in advance or six to 12 months in advance so that they know if they fail X course, they will then be slotted into the new curriculum in Y course? As long as they know that and they understand all of that, then it goes much more smoothly than saying, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do now? What are we gonna do for these students? We don't wanna do it on a case-by-case -case basis. We want to have a contingency plan, a proactive contingency plan. The other thing on the next slide, a couple of other points, is that we also want to get input from our program advisory committee. We want to be sure that our clinical partners are not only educated and informed through the entire process, but get their input into decisions. Because particularly as it affects clinical, which could be another whole you know, session in itself, they need to know what you're doing and why you're changing what you've always done. Because after all, are we staff or are we there to learn? And I think that's a question we always ask ourselves and it's a fine balance, of course. And keep detailed records of everything you do, a minute so that all decisions are documented, we all, and everybody has a copy of everything. I think documentation is absolutely crucial for a successful transition to a CBC. And finally, let me just tell you a little bit about outcomes, success stories. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I'm just going to tell you that these stories are in the literature as well as my own experience. When this first came out, probably 15 years ago or so, there were some negative uh, outcomes by a few schools, primarily centered around a lowered NCLEX pass rate. That is no longer true. So please be sure that you know that the NCLEX rates have been increased or maintained. We've had new graduate and employer satisfaction that has been maintained or actually increased. Program completion rates have not gone down. In fact, they've increased if you do it right. And again, this, these are success stories if we do it the way it's supposed to be done, as I've described, I should say that. And then the most important part because we know this is a major crisis right now. There have been articles in the past year that have said we're at a crisis point with the lack of even basic clinical judgment skills by graduates, new graduates. So we need to increase that. If you want to know more about some of the information I provided, I did provide you with a reference list. If you have specific uh, questions about the, some of the research or some of the articles about the successes, um, I would tell you that uh, my book, Teaching and Learning in a Concept-Based Nursing Curriculum, um, has a lot of references and to these studies so that you can certainly uh, share those. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Jen uh, for question time. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks, Donna, for that really engaging and informative presentation. So at this time, we will take questions. I noticed there have been a few that have come in during the course of the, the hour, but I did just want to give you a few pieces of information. Donna has been kind enough to share her email address in case you have any questions that come up as you um, start to implement a concept-based curriculum or if you have anything, um, any questions about getting up and running on that as well. If you'd like to purchase her textbook, you can save 25% today with the coupon at CBC25 and the expiration date on that is uh, June 1st. And if you would like to share this webinar or if you'd like to view it again, it will be up on our YouTube channel and I will be sure to share this uh, in the follow-up email that you get at the end of the presentation. So Donna, we do have a question from Teresa and she says, across the lifespan teaching, do you mean the specialty faculty, PEDS, OB mental health, would come to the class and participate in the exemplar, for example, diabetes, fundamentals, med surge, OB, and PEDS? Yes, that is what I mean. It does not mean, however, that we need 20 people in for a class. Um, so, for example, there are some topics that and one individual could handle, but then there are some things that are so specific, for example, in OB, which is certainly not my area of expertise, um, that are so specific to OB that even as a med surge expert, I would probably be hard pressed to present. Uh, so I would need the expertise of that person so that we would work together, um, perhaps teach it together as opposed to turn teaching, perhaps even team teaching. Um, but we don't want, you know, 10 people or eight people or even four people uh, there at one time. Um, so we would organize it so that 
I've, what I've seen in most institutions is, for example, uh, perhaps the second semester of nursing, uh, wherever that may appear, uh, there might be a focus on uh, mental health and med search. So they would work together to uh, teach that information. So it wouldn't be everybody involved. Um, because diabetes is diabetes, hypertension is hypertension. The big thing about uh, all of that is that with peds, for example, it's developmental. So I would need the expert, perhaps, at the developmental um, folks, the, the peds people. But it doesn't mean that the peds person would have to come in and teach it, per se. It just depends on the topic. That's what I've seen in practice. Great. Uh, thank you, Donna. Okay, we have another one from uh, Cheryl. She said, in the 1970s, I taught in a brand new BSN program that used an integrated curriculum. We had 100% NCLEX pass rates year after year. Is that an old term for concept-based curriculum? Well, hi, Cheryl. Uh, I know Cheryl. And uh, I think it was the beginning of that. Um, certainly, the integration was that we did teach these diseases and processes one time. Um, and um, but we didn't really do it by concept. I also uh, taught in a program like that, um, and we didn't teach by concept. We taught by diseases. But when we talked about hypertension, it was across the lifespan. So yes, that was a beginning modality. And I love the fact that you said you had 100% pass rate because that is what we found as well. So there is something to be said for students' understanding and connectivity and thinking to be integrated or lifespan approach, absolutely. Another question, Donna, is from another faculty member asking, what does a concept-based clinical experience look like? Oh my goodness, that would take probably another hour. But just briefly, if you look at the uh, work of Giddens and some of her articles and uh, some of the other articles that are excellent, I'd be glad if that person would email me personally, I could send you the reference. Um, what the value of clinical uh, conceptual learning is all about. Uh, clinical, don't go in and be a staff member and do everything that everybody else does. Uh, you do pieces of that direct care as well as do focused learning activities that aren't touching the patient but support and learning activities and thinking activities that are focusing on concepts that support the learning. For example, data mining. Data mining um, is an excellent activity where if we were learning about nutrition, for example, and fundamentals, we might look at nutritional indices um, that help us assess the status of one's nutrition. We might be comparing three patients uh, and going into the medical record in the HR, whatever type of medical record there is, uh, pulling out lab data. We might be doing assessments of weight. We might be looking at uh, skin checker, uh, skin uh, integrity. Uh, we might be looking at all those ways that we assess one's nutrition and then comparing and contrast and then how the interventions would be different based on individualized needs. So we have to allow an opportunity for digging deeper into the concepts. It might mean we don't give a back every day. But that's okay. Maybe that is the focus of the day. Maybe we are learning about functional ability and we're in a rehab unit and bathing would be important but not particularly at every day we go into class or we don't go into clinical rather. So we also want to be sure that what we're doing in clinical connects with what we're doing in class. So this week we're talking about nutrition and elimination. We should plan purposeful, and that is the word Dr. Giddens has continually used. We should be planning purposeful learning activities, both direct care and focused learning activities that are not direct care that support that. And again, the that's a very quick answer for a very large question. Thanks, Donna. And I can be sure that you get um, that person's contact information if you wanted to follow up. Mary has a question saying, do you recommend a team teaching approach when implementing a concept-based curriculum or a traditional one teacher group approach? I would assume a team approach lends itself to reinforcement and scaffolding of concepts. You are absolutely, your assumption is absolutely correct. I recommend a team approach. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions at this time. I want to give a warm thank you to Donna for taking her time today to talk with us all about this important concept. Um, this is a follow-up webinar to one that she hosted last year following the release of her textbook. And 
If you do have any additional questions for Donna, please feel free to reach out to her directly. You can also purchase her textbook on our website. We've set up a shortened URL, go.jblearning.com slash cbnc. And you'll also be able to see um, the webinar again or be able to share it with colleagues if you like. It will be posted to our YouTube channel shortly. So this time I'd like to wish everyone a great weekend and thank you for joining us and a special thank you to Donna for a wonderful presentation today. Thank you.